Thank you, Steve. And thanks for that very nice introduction. I couldn't have written it any better myself. So, um, so I work for Market, I've already heard the introduction, so I won't give any more to that introduction, but it's probably just worth uh, looking back to where we've come from in this world of cyber threats and risks that we now face. So back in the year 2000, so a, a year when I had a lot less gray hair than I have today, I was a, a fledgling kind of security professional. Um, so I've been in the industry for only three years. When I first was um, brought upon task to manage one of the first, what you would be regarded as the, the first cyber attack, I guess, that we see a, a lot of today. So back then there was a, a very prominent uh, virus or, or computer worm that infected a multitude of systems around the world called I Love You, uh, sometimes referred to um, the I Love You virus or the I Love You letter. And um, it, was a, it was a game changer in, in, in respect of what it, was actually, uh, what it actually happened. Within, within only 10 days, over 50 million infections were reported globally. Um, and it actually brought down 10% of the world's infrastructure. So this gives you an idea back in 2000 you know, what impact this, this one particular, but just one variant of, of, a, of a virus had. And an estimated cost of uh, nine, nine billion in damages. So we see similar attacks happening today, the likes of Sony, uh, and uh, we have uh, a multitude of different uh, attacks that happen today. And those are kind of paling into the significance in terms of what the costs are that these uh, companies are now facing. So this actually was a simple phishing attack um, and played to the natural curiosity of every human, basically. Uh, and interestingly enough, this phishing attack that actually happened back there was predicated on a simple email uh, with the message in there saying, I love you. Somebody clicked on the, on the attachment, which then attached to all their, address, all their addresses in their address book and then flooded uh, the email systems around the world resulting in what I just described. Uh, interesting, interestingly enough, that this is still uh, the chosen vector or threat vector of actors today, uh, and that's not changed. So we're seeing that the simple phishing attack and also the more prevalent that we're beginning to see, spear phishing, which is more targeted attack, uh, is beginning to take hold. And I think that's interesting that we look back into year 2000 and we are today, and in really in terms of mitigating some of these threats, we haven't really been able to, to get on top of it. Um, and that's quite a worrying uh, thing for me as a security professional because all that time I've been tackling this, working with a number of different vendors to help get on top of this. So which is why I welcome uh, the NIS directive to help us collaborate and information share. Because over that time, what we did see was a number of different technologies brought in to solve the problem. Um, and as a result, none of these technologies spoke very well with each other and have communicated very well with each other. And we have this mishmash of technologies in the infrastructure not really helping to, to mitigate the threat. Um, information sharing is now the most important aspect of tackling cybercrime. Uh, and I welcome any initiatives that actually allow us to do that. So... So why, I guess, uh, has it become so prominent uh, these days? So back then it was called information security. Cyber, as a term, has only been really used in the last five years uh, as a significant term to describe so cyber risk. And I think we've seen this as a result of um, it becoming a political agenda, and obviously this is, we've seen this in the, in the Commission, and I think that's a result of the news headlines that we're obviously seeing. And I think we're also seeing it becoming uh, the attack that's being used of criminal gangs now. So no longer does a criminal need to go into a bank with a shotgun to steal the money um, because not only are the penalties quite high, but the, the risk of being caught are quite high. Of course, doing things online means there's less chance of you being caught. And also the penalties at the moment are fairly low. So hence criminal gangs in, in China, Russia and other places are flourishing in this new world of, of the Internet. And, and indeed cyber. It's also a, a, a big p a political advantage. So intellectual property that's developed, mainly I guess in the developing world, is now worth a significant amount of money to uh, foreign, uh, foreign bodies around the world to speed up their development of you know, their own critical national infrastructures, 
but also developments in defence, etc. So, one of the things that I'd just kind of like to leave you with is, is kind of my thoughts, really, on where, basically what I've just talked about, but some of the things that we might need to consider in how we tackle this. So, typically, uh, a cyber attack is what I would regard as bang. Uh, bang being the, the incident that happens, and you've kind of got left of bang and, and right of bang. Bang is inevitable, so a breach is inevitable. That's kind of accepted in the industry. And as a practitioner, that's quite a concern for me that this is going to, it's inevitable and it's going to happen. Uh, traditionally, we've spent most of our investments on protection, um, but we're going to see a shift over the next, I would say, bit, by about 2020, of around 60% of security investments moving to detection and response. That's an acknowledgement that the, uh, the attackers are already in your environment today, and what we need to do is to stop them getting to their ultimate objective, which is typically the crown jewels, intellectual capital, or the, or the sensitive information of your entire network. So in terms of prepare, and Steve made mention to this earlier, we need to do much more about the prepare phase. So, protect, so you've kind of got prepare, protect, bang, detect, respond, and manage and recover. So in the prepare phase, simulation is going to become hugely important, which Steve already made reference to. Uh, understanding the adversaries that are actually going after you, understanding the patterns and why they are attacking your particular industry. And I think in the finance industry, this will be critically important. Data classification is the kind of, uh, the holy grail really of any corporation. Understand where your sensitive data is and classifying that data so that you know what levels of protection to put around it. Still in the prepare phase. And then awareness and in education, probably the least expensive of all the security managers that you can put in, but probably the most effective and least used in my opinion. So I think that's a great opportunity. In protect, well, that's around moving security closer to the asset that you're trying to protect. Um, I'm we'll not getting into discussions a bit more about that later. I've got some idea. I used to, I was on the board of the Jericho Forum, which was a thought leader organization probably about 10 years ago, which was basically saying that the hard shell perimeter that companies use to protect themselves no longer exists and therefore move security closer to the assets. Um, having said bang, then you're moving into the detect and protect, uh, respond phase. So this is about using skilled resources and technology together to be able to find where those indicators are compromised are in your infrastructure. And then uh, back to another point that Steve made, which I thought interesting, was much more around the behavior of people. So people-centric security rather than technology base. And when we talk about people, technology, and process, people is, is definitely the most important piece of that. And then on the recover phase, um, certainly business continuity planning is, a, for me, an integral part of information security. And if you look at information security standards such as ISO 27002, stroke one as an auditing requirement, then, you know, BCP, business continuity planning, is certainly an important part of that, because you need to be able to recover just as quickly as you need to detect and protect your environment. Um, just two other points I just want to leave you with. There's two very important reports that have just come out, two threat reports. Um, they came out, they both released yesterday, one that came out from Verizon uh, Business Services, which is a, a breach uh, investigation report, comes out annually. I would regard as probably one of the best reports on cybersecurity activity. Um, takes input from a number of organizations. I think actually some of the panel members are contributors to that as well, I, I noticed. So a very good report. Um, interestingly, some, it, it makes note for them some of these basic attacks that haven't changed uh, in all that time. So they're still saying the same things. And then the semantic threat report, which is very technical focused and talks to some of the very sophisticated attacks that are coming out and some of those criminal gangs and how they operate, uh, you know, with a hundred with the, the CEO at the top and a chain of command. In, you know, they're well-funded organizations. So Semantic have some very good information on what those criminal gangs look like, how they're distributed around the world, and how they're targeting organizations specifically in the financial services sector. Um, I think that's pretty much it in terms of wrapping up. I don't want to take up too much of time. So thanks very much. <laughs>